Welcome to Shades of Us. I'm your host, Daryl Brown. This month, Disability Visibility. We speak with several wheelchair users who range from athlete to advocate right here in New York City. According to a survey by Disabled Sports USA on the relationship between involvement in sports and employment levels, disabled sports participants are twice as likely to find work than the general population of disabled adults. Here's a CUNY wheelchair basketball star who was recently invited to try out for the Paralympics. My name is Seira Larrauri. Uh, I'm from Puerto Rico, 25 years old. I play wheelchair basketball for CUNY. I was selected to go to the USA Paralympic tryouts for the USA team, and I'm actually the first CUNY athlete that gets to that point in any sport. My name is Ryan Martin. I'm the director for inclusive and adaptive sports at CUNY. She's just got, aside from, you know, the skill set she has as an athlete, you know, ability to score the basketball, she's just the kind of person that you could see teammates really working well with and following. The idea of starting with her as a basketball player uh, made a lot of sense for a brand new program as we, you know, we launched the women's basketball team. I play able buddy basketball for basically all my life. I did that until 2014 when I was done basically because I knew my hip condition wasn't gonna allow me to go any further. When I was seven years old, my joint ball didn't got enough oxygen, so it disappeared completely. So I could be walking anywhere and just boop, my hip would come out. I was in La Lorenzo Vizcarrondo back in Puerto Rico. That was my high school. And we actually got like municipal championship all three years. So I, after that, I was like, you know what, that's it. I'll end on a good note, that's fine. I don't need to do this anymore. I'm not gonna go to college and do this because I'm gonna get hurt. But then my mom, throughout this ent entire process of me saying I'm gonna play able-bodied basketball, she was like, there is sitting basketball. Like, just don't be so stubborn. Sit down. I was like, I'm not gonna sit down yet. I'm not gonna sit down yet. 2014 came by. I was ready to just stop playing. And then we went to the movies for my birthday that same summer. We saw the Puerto Rico Federation of wheelchair basketball standing there. I saw them, I just kept walking. I was like, I know who you guys are. I'm not gonna do it. Like I'm too, like pride kind of got the best of me in that moment. And then my mom saw them and she was like, we're doing this. I was like, okay, we're doing this then. <laughs> so when I met coach Ryan, uh, I was in Florida. I was at a Walmart with my mom, just doing groceries, minding my own business. And then all of a sudden I receive a Facebook message from Ryan Martin. So yeah, I don't think you remember me, but I remember you and I want you to play for me. Not playing with Brooklyn Nets, not playing with Liberty, not playing with Puerto Rico. It was like, I like it, I'm doing it, I love it. That's it, it was like just for fun. When I started playing for Coach Ryan, it was more like, okay, professional status is like, we go to practices, we do this, we do that. And it was like an entire regimen that I wasn't used to it necessarily, but it, it kind of made it better and it made the difference, if you ask me. Um, I think Sierra and I have one thing in common. I think uh, our moms are really, um, are really the folks that drive us. Like my mom was the first person who told me I was gonna go to college, right? And you know, the first person who said, you know, hey, if something's in your way, get out of your bleeping wheelchair and move the thing. You know, and at times I thought it was really harsh as an eight or nine year old, but it really, you know, as I looked, as I've lived in different countries and navigated different things, and I'd like to consider myself relatively successful, um, I think she was really that person who always pushed me. And I know Sierra's mom is very much like that. Um, you know, when Sierra's mom calls or texts me, it's, uh, yes, ma'am, whatever you want, ma'am. <laughs> no problem, ma'am. Going to Colorado Springs uh, for the tryouts was ner nerve-wracking. It really was. I was anxious throughout, I think, the last entire month before going there. Anxiety was taking the best of me. I had to call my mom almost every single day. <laughs> All of that kind of just went away because it was like, 
all right, this is this is home basically. Like, this is cool. Um, and I just met amazing people left to right. And even the players that were already at that level that had like two or three Paralympic games in their belts, they were so willing to like teach and, and, and sit down with you and be like, no, like do this, look for this, look for that, change this or change that. So just, just being there, it's like, yep, I love it. <laughs> I didn't went through, like I didn't got selected for the second part of the process but I kind of knew that was going to happen because I'm pretty new at this level. Because yes, I've been playing wheelchair basketball for a long time, but not at this level. So just getting there with just a year and a half of experience was pretty big. She's kind of like a, you know, like kind of like a campfire. Everybody wants to get close to Sierra, right? Because she, you know, her personality and just, just such a great person. Every great leader learns that they have to do it differently with each person. You just can't have a bully pulpit approach across the board. And I think she's starting to develop um, some of those leadership skills that are, you know, maybe not the rah, rah, rah all the time, but maybe put the arm around your teammate and say, hey, we're going to be okay. Um, and I think, you know, so I, I've enjoyed watching her journey as a basketball player and even as a person thus far, and, I, and I'm glad we have some more time with her before she graduates. And she has to graduate or her mom's gonna kill me and her. <laughs> According to Disability Pride NYC on inclusion, awareness, and visibility, Disability Pride Month has been celebrated in July since 1990. Although it is not a nationally recognized holiday, the number of cities participating in disability pride events continue to grow. Making other wheelchair users' voices heard is how our next guest chooses to live her life. When I look in the mirror, I think I see someone unbreakable. Hi, I'm Lucy Richardson and I'm the founder of Wheel New Yorkers. I've had invisible disabilities for a long time, but I never really uh, thought of myself as a disabled person. The reason that I started Wheel New Yorkers was that I was a new New Yorker when I became a wheelchair user. I first came to New York City from Sydney, Australia in the fall of 2014 to do an internship. In February of 2016, I got the first symptoms of what would eventually be diagnosed as a rare type of motor neuron disease called primary lateral sclerosis, or PLS. I turned 30 that year. PLS isn't considered to, to be fatal or to have an impact on lifespan. I could feel Sam, my partner, next to me, and he was holding my hand. It sent me into the new phase of my life, which was dealing with the diagnosis, and I started using a wheelchair full-time at the end of 2016. At first, when I became a wheelchair user, it felt like my world shrunk. The first time I went by a store where I looked in the window and went, oh yeah, I wanna check that out, and then there were five steps to get in. And the first time that happened, I was so angry at myself, not at the building, not at the store, not at New York City. I felt like my body had betrayed me. As time went on, you know, I started to see that the problem wasn't me. The problem was the environment and the barriers in the environment. And I started to notice the other people who were also struggling with, you know, these you know, buildings that have steps and no ramps. I did develop some more anger. It was more at the systems that existed in the world. I knew about the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. I have a range of health issues, but I have uh, endometriosis and adenomyosis. So what that means is that you're constantly experiencing pain. I was 20, Two, I got into this, um, this program um, at one of the best hospitals in Australia to deal with um, chronic pain. But what they told me in this pain management course is, yes, there is nothing we can do about it, but you can do something about how you react to it. They had this quote and it was, 
You can't change the cards you've been dealt, but you can change the way that you play them. And I decided to go all out. I'm gonna live my life out loud. I was using social media and because of my love of makeup, you know, I followed a lot of different makeup artists and on my Explore page, I saw a makeup artist and I decided to click on the picture because I was like, oh wow, she looks great. I wanna see, you know, what else she has. And I clicked on her profile and she was a wheelchair user. And then I saw a photo of her with a group of other women in wheelchairs and they were a dance team. Then they posted about basically having a wheelchair dance camp in LA. I signed up, I paid the deposit, I booked my flights, I booked my hotel room. This is summer 2018. I go to the opening night and I go into this room. There's like 100, 150 other women there, plus, you know, a few parents, friends, boyfriends, kids, whatever. And everyone looked like me. Everyone was a wheelchair user. And I met a few women who were from New York City. It's like it went into the next phase of my life where I had friends and they could you know, they'd been wheelchair users for longer than me. Uh, one of them was a born and raised New Yorker. I learned about how to navigate New York City as a wheelchair user. I thought, I really want to show us all off. I wanted other people to be able to meet each other too. So in January of 2020, I decided to launch Wheel New Yorkers. I started with an Instagram page. I made a little logo, which is um, the updated disability icon of a wheelchair user in Statue of Liberty green, <laughs> wearing the little crown and holding the little torch. I thought at first I would just post some pictures of, yeah, my friends and I, but also the other people in the community who I'd gotten to know through social media. I could also share links to the existing organizations in New York City. Then I thought, you know, rather than just reposting someone's picture, I could talk to people and say, hey, tell me a bit about yourself. And it's like I'd have a little mini profile about them. So Will New York has had a couple of great events at the start of 2020. There was all these people that I'd spoken to on social media, but I hadn't met in real life. And um, it was amazing. I connected with incredible people, people with different careers, people um, who, who are doing their own work in the community, people who are designing products for our community. To me, I feel very strongly about, um, you know, diversity within disability. Unfortunately, towards the end of um, 2021, uh, my health took a bit of a turn for the worse and it was becoming, you know, impossible really to, um, to manage my health, to work full time and to, to run Wheel New Yorkers. So I had to make, you know, the very difficult decision to press pause on Wheel New Yorkers uh, in October of 2021. We have real things to offer and that's what we want you to look at. We don't want you to reduce us to a stereotype, to a you know, one-dimensional caricature. And we, we want you to see all of us in all our diversity and what we contribute to make New York City the place that it is. According to data from the National Center for Education Statistics, Nearly 7 million students with disabilities in the U.S. make up 14% of national public school enrollment. Let's meet a 27-year-old advocate for people with disabilities whose mission is to open doors for those like her after they graduate high school. My purpose is to be a voice for others and help them see their dreams and goals come true. My name is Katrina Hazel. I'm an advocate for people with disabilities and I'm the founder of Disability Champions Mentoring Network. I would describe me a person with a disability first and I would also describe me as a black woman. My parents are from the Caribbean, so in the Caribbean, disability is not always visible. They basically had to raise me with an open book because they had no idea what a disability was at that time. When I was younger, I struggled to accept my disability. 
my elementary school was very inclusive. They made sure that we were all included, but in middle school and high school, um, they didn't include much people with disability. So I was often left out. Because in high school, the only plan they had for me was to be placed in a day program. One path is often not the same for everyone with a disability because disability is not a one size fit all approach. They didn't really help me in terms of transition planning. They didn't never talk to me about my goals and dreams. With Disability Champions Mentoring Network, I created it in a way to help students with disabilities transition from high school into whatever they dream to be and allow it to have no barrier. It includes a mentoring program, a face-to-face -face component, and it also includes a, a video series where people will get to share their story just like me. Because of Disability Champions Mentoring Network, um, the community and friendships I formed um, was with a lot of um, professionals in the field. They want to support the work that I do with Disability Champions. And I received my first uh, community grant um, to be able to build it into a nonprofit organization. One of my goals for Disability Champions Mentoring Network and all the work that I do is to be able to give back to the underserved community because where I live and where I went to school for most of my time is considered the underserved community. When I go into places where I see people with disabilities, um, I often feel like, yeah, this is the place for me because um, it's like safe and they understand what it's like to have a disability. Growing up, I was very shy and I didn't speak to anyone besides my mom and dad and siblings. Being a person of color has impacted my journey because I never really get to see much people like me doing the work that I do. I watched my mom and dad journey raising me and how they often had to advocate for me with school and the doctors um, to get me what I needed. I think I kind of wanted to follow their footsteps. I didn't really know that I liked doing public speaking. It was just an opportunity that I got, I believe, in 2014. One of the organizations that I used to be a part of, they asked me, did I wanted to speak at their like Women Who Care Gala at that time? And they said that if I say yes, that my life would never be the same again. So that was the first time I got to speak to over 500 people. When I'm doing the speech and talking to people, and after like the audience are clapping or sharing their feedback, it feels good that they were able to hear me because I know from far, even before I get on stage, they don't realize that I'm doing the work that I do and that I'm capable of doing it or that I can even speak at times. I want people to understand that people with disabilities want the same life as people without disabilities and we should just be given the opportunity to focus on our dreams and goals and what we can do. Writing about his journey from tragedy to triumph is how this author inspires others. I feel like whether you have a disability or not, everybody's faced with challenges. And I feel like my book is a resource to help people get past some of these situations. My name is Jeff Williams. I'm the author of My Feet Are Off The Ground. I have a son that I had when I was 30 years old, and my son is proud of me, and I wanted to leave my story for him. When COVID first happened, and I was confined to my apartment, 
I felt like I didn't want to just sit around and waste the time. I uh, decided I would write my story. When I would meet people for the first time, they always asked me, like, what happened to you while you are in a wheelchair? And when I would tell them in the background on the fact that I was accidentally shot when I was 13 years old, it sparked something in them that I started to notice, like, I'm really inspiring people, I'm motivating people with my life, with my story. June 25th, 1982 is when I had my accident. Growing up in the South Bronx at the time, I went to school that morning and one of my friends who didn't go to the school, he called me and said that he wanted me to come to his house so we could ride some bikes. So after school, my brother and I went to his apartment on 165th and Nelson Avenue. And when we got to the apartment to go pick the bikes up, then he went to the back room and he came back with a gun and he was showing me the gun. And I felt like the gun wasn't real. In that split second, I just heard a loud boom and I saw the fire. So the bullet went down on an angle and hit a nerve on my spine. So immediately I felt my legs got numb. So I started tapping my legs. When I first heard that I was gonna be paralyzed, I really didn't even understand the degree or the dynamics of what that entailed. I was like broken so many pieces where I couldn't even cry, I couldn't even, like I, I really didn't even know what to do with that information. I remember my mother saying to me like, look, you know, you can't sit here and cry every day. You gotta make a decision. If you're gonna be in this wheelchair, then treat it like a Rolls Royce and make the best of it. And don't let no doctor tell you what you can't do because the doctor pretty much told me like I wouldn't sit up no more. I wouldn't walk again, things like that. My mother convinced me that, you know, no matter what my situation was, I could still be great. And I believed her. Before being in a wheelchair myself, I honestly didn't know people was in wheelchairs. Because of how society treated people with disabilities and treated people in wheelchairs, they kind of wrote them off to me. So I felt like I have to be this person to break these doors down. I have to be this person that advocates for everybody with a disability. And I thought about being a criminal lawyer at the time. So I left high school, I graduated and went to John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And while I was in John Jay before I graduated, I had a friend working with this organization called Just One Break. And they was basically the bridge between someone with a disability and the corporate world. I actually interviewed for a position as a paralegal. I really didn't qualify for that position. I ended up getting the position in the mailroom. I stayed there maybe two years, and then I ended up getting promoted to their legal department, and I've been there 25 years. In June 2019, I thought about making a pair of sneakers because I was actually thinking I want something that represents walking. I ended up contacting this company in Italy and I wrote them a letter because they had a sneaker company and told them my story and I asked them could I design a pair of sneakers. My middle name is Lorenzo so I took the J off Jeff and I called my brother and he was like no name him J Lorenzo. So I digitally made the sneakers, the color schemes, and things like that. When I got the box, I named the box my feet off the ground. Inside each one of my sneakers is a motivational quote, and one of the quotes that I have in the sneaker is, when you think about giving up, remember why you started. Now, to make the sneakers more accessible for people that can't really use their hands with it, maybe Velcro straps and things like that. I also make Jay Lorenzo apparel, like hoodies, and sweatpants and sweatsuits. I made a hoodie, and then the one that I made for myself, I turned the O into a wheelchair. And I had a wheelchair on the top of the hood. And everybody's like, I want that one. My clothing line is for everybody. And even though I have a disability, I don't want to ever exclude the able-bodied community. I want to connect with somebody and leave like a footprint on their life. This is something Jeff helped me do. This is something that we did together, we built together. I've been visible on social media and through my Instagram pages and stuff like that. I think it indirectly just motivates people. Seeing that I have a smile on my face in a wheelchair and just seeing the movement of somebody who they thought couldn't do all these things navigate the world 
and don't let nothing stop me. Uh, I mean, I get in my car and I have somebody from eight to 80 standing there staring at me like, I don't mean to stare at you, but I'm just fascinated. Like, how do you drive? The way I drive my cars, I have custom hand control device. So next to the steering wheel, there's this device that's like, a, like right next to it where you push it for the brake and you pull it down for the gas, drive with my hands and not my feet. I tell people all the time, you know, sometimes you gotta look in the mirror and just be satisfied with who you are as you are. Because anybody that can't accept you for who you are as you are, if you don't accept my wheelchair, you don't accept me. That's our show for now. If you want to know more about the people you saw, log on to our website at tv.cuny.edu. I'm Daryl Brown. See you next time on Shades of Us.